Captain, we have them. We've established Transporter Lock, the Star Trek podcast. Join Ken and Sabriel each week as they explore strange new episodes, seek out new plots and new characters, and boldly go where no podcast has gone before. Hello and welcome to Transporter Lock. As always, sometimes usually, I am Captain Sabriel Mastin, and joined by me as always, sometimes usually... My chief engineer. Welcome, Chief. Hi. Hello, it's Ken Gaddy. Nice to meet you. Sabriel, when you are sometimes always maybe Captain Sabriel Maston, when are you not? Or what I are you I was debating how that was going to come out across. <laughs> I was trying to imply I'm not always here. <laughs> well, maybe you're like Major Barrett, where you are Nurse Chapel and Loxana of Troy and the voice of the ship's computer. Yes. You have multiple roles. I am also Nurse Chapel and Loxana of Troy. And, and the, voice the voice of the voice computer. Of the well, you know, when the ship has a crew complement of two, that being the captain and the chief engineer, <laughs> we all need to play multiple roles. That's right. And sometimes you're just stuck in a static warp bubble. Those who get it, get it. Those who don't, watch some more Star Trek Next Generation. Never existed in the first place. That's right. <laughs> uh, we got two episodes we're going to talk about today. But first, we got some sad news as former Star Trek Enterprise showrunner Manny Cotto passed away this week of cancer. Yeah, and he's somebody that you and I didn't fully appreciate all the stuff he had done after Enterprise. You no, know, I had I basically once Enterprise was over, I completely gone. But he was he worked on Dexter, Twenty Four, uh, American Horror Stories, and American Horror Story. And uh, yeah, I honestly nope, completely gone. And out once Enterprise is over, I, I, season four was a really great series, and. Uh, of Enterprise and uh, ended too soon. Yeah, I think he was specifically the executive producer and showrunner for the final season of Enterprise, which was mm -hmm. the best season of Enterprise. Yeah. And I I haven't reevaluated this opinion in the last six years with all the new Trek, but for a long time, I was of the opinion that the fourth season of Enterprise was the best single season of any Trek ever. Uh huh. It, it holds up really well still, and still in my opinion. Yeah. Maybe I should need go rewatch the final season of D Space Nine with its like ten episode final arc. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But yeah, Enterprise season four was everything we were hoping Enterprise would be from the beginning, and it finally got there just in time to be canceled. Thanks, Paramount minus. <laughs> Paramount minus. <laughs> but yeah, Mandy Cotto did great work on that show, and the other shows he worked on weren't the kinds of things I would watch. Like Twenty Four is not my bag, but you know, I'm I'm glad that. Other shows had the benefit of his experience and expertise, and uh, he was gone too soon. He was 62 years old. He was born in Havana, Cuba, passed away in Pasadena, California from pancreatic cancer on July 9th at the age of 62. What a shame. Yeah. We always like to open our transporter locks with sad news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now that we got that out of the way. We're going to continue the sad news as we talk about Among the Lotus Leader Eaters. <laughs> Yeah, this was sort of a, I mean, Strange New Worlds is doing a pretty good job of balancing serious episodes with campier episodes. And I think the two episodes you and I are going to be discussing today represent that balance, starting with Among the Lotus Eaters. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait for the forgetting on this one. I hated this episode. I would agree that of the first four episodes of the season, this was the weakest one to date, but... I, clearly, you have stronger feelings about it than I do. To me, this is one of the weakest episodes of Star Trek. <laughs> really? <laughs> I was so bored. It was we had no character development to me, and I don't care about Captain Battelle and Captain Pike at all. Betrell, 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 and Captain Pike. I don't care about that relationship at all. Because it's hetero. <laughs> no, you would think that, but no, they just are boring to me. They've been, okay. They were from the, one of the opening scenes of Strange New Worlds, and there's just nothing there interesting to me. It's not yeah, like they she, don't like the characters. Just them together, I don't care about. Yeah, she was in the cabin before he even got called back into duty, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, I sometimes forget how far back that character goes. And if, When she first showed up in this episode, I was like, this is superficial of me, but her hair was different from it was in the trial episode. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And I was like, wait, is that is that the lawyer? Is that the same person? <laughs> Because 
in that lawyer episode, there was no romantic overtures. Like, yeah, they had drinks together and she gave him some advice about staying off the stand. But I just forgot that they were a couple. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, so this episode was a callback to the pilot. Um, when uh, Pike is talking to his doctor uh, in Pike's quarters, he talks about this mission, uh, the original mission that led to this episode. And um, sure, I mean that's a neat callback. Let's let's make the pilot even more canon than Discovery did. Um, uh, there was one oddity right away. We show um, our three people who were lost on that mission in current day uniforms instead of Discovery era uniforms. <laughs> Oops, yep. but that wasn't a major complaint. Like whatever. Um, but honestly, this episode was just I. Watched it twice. Now I have to sadly watch it third time with my partner <laughs> when we catch up. I'm just not looking forward to it at all. I can't wait to forget this. Well, I need to point out that you omitted a very important fact. Uh-huh. In the pilot episode, when Pike is in his quarters talking about this episode, he wasn't talking to his doctor. He was talking to his space doctor. A space doctor. I, you know, I almost thought about making a reference to that. A space doctor as they're having space alcohol in right. his space quarters. <laughs> That's right. Just want to get that I, on the record. Know, watch the clip that scene everybody and how much they talk about space law and space this and space that uh they were clearly doing this uh, mid 60s thing of trying to sound futuristic and it comes off so bad now yeah (laughs) so the two things you pointed out are actually things that i overlooked in the show i watched this episode in person with former guest of the show commodore mark thompson who was Mm -hmm. not able to join us today to talk about it but he pointed out hey this is rigel seven from the cage like, mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, it, it was? I, I had no idea. And then he pointed out, yeah, and those are not the right uniforms that people are wearing. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm So the first thing, the first part about it being canon, I'm like, oh, that's not necessary, but it's kind of cool, too, that they picked up on something like that and decided to expand on it. And the uniforms, I'm surprised that the continuity testers at Paramount let that slip because, yes – there have been a lot of different uniforms at Star Trek, at Starfleet, and it's hard to keep track of them all, but that seems like an easy one to catch. Right? Maybe they got rid of all the Discovery uniforms in the sense of the future. Like, well, we don't need these anymore. <laughs> Put them in the Reclamator. <laughs> yeah, or maybe when they assign new uniforms, it's retroactive. Uh, like, yes, all right, it goes go, back through time. Uh-huh. Yeah, go scrub all the historical records. <laughs> you know. I mean... And all I could think of watching this episode is Prodigy did it better with the Enterpriseians having a strand oh. of member. Yeah. Uh, and everyone um, taking some of their culture and everything like that. Like, they did it way better. Uh, I just did not care about this episode. Everyone forgetting themselves. Um, uh, there was one cheeky moment I didn't catch, which Char, my friend. Uh, Who's been on the show? Um, yep. Uh, Captain Pike makes some kind of odd odd reference to them being in a cage you know being a reference to the cage episode um i missed that entirely both times to watch that well it was funny when mark was telling me about yeah they were talking about rigel seven in the cage and i was like well in this episode they were in a literal cage and i couldn't hear that mark was pronouncing the cage with capital letters Mm -hmm. as an episode title i was like oh not the cage but the cage (laughs) got it well also the cage uh, yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, see, you were thinking about the Lower Decks episode. I was thinking about the Enterprise episode, Twilight. Uh, is that the one where they went to the planet with the tricorder because they actually left behind? No, I, this is the episode where Archer wakes up every day and his memory yep, is yep, that, that of was, like that, yep. 12 years ago. Uh huh. So, every so to Paul is his caregiver, and every single day she has to explain. Here's what's happened in the last 10 years, the last 11 years, the last 12 years. Because they're hiding wakes up. from the Zindi. Yeah, they are the last starfighter, basically. And so seeing Pike wake up every day with no memory felt a little similar to me, but far less poignant uh-huh. because the straits were less dire. There was no caregiving happening. Uh, I, I'm sure, though, that even as much as you didn't like this episode and the forgetting, you probably enjoyed... The forgetting that was experienced by Erica Ortega's. Uh, honestly, even that felt kind of weird. But like, like there were bits and parts of the sh- episode I liked, and like Erica having a moment was cool. But also, 
oh, this, uh, all I could think about is this makes no this planet makes no sense. <laughs> And uh, this, this mission makes no sense. Like, why aren't they flying farther away? Just nothing. Even Erica's moment felt weird to me. Like, nothing on the Enterprise itself felt natural as well. It felt hmm. so off. I uh, Just everything about this was a miss and a miss and a miss for me. Yeah, it felt odd that Spock prepared those data pads with their profiles, and then he forgot how to read it when they had already explained, you don't forget your core skills, things you've done a thousand times. Like Nurse Chapel can still dress a wound. She just can't do complicated surgery. But now Spock can't read? Well, no one could read. Yeah, it wasn't just him. It was everybody. Well, Erica must have known how to read the display on her panel to fly the ship. She was just pushing buttons. Everything felt natural. She knew what to push. Just like, muscle memory. I don't like. I don't read the keys on my keyboard. It's all natural. Same True. way for Erica fly, flying the ship, or when I'm driving. I don't think about. I just manually do my hand movements, whatever. I don't think about when I'm driving. It's just second nature. Which I gotta tell you, when I spent a month this year driving in New Zealand and Australia, that was complicated. <laughs> I had to be very conscious. Like every time I strapped myself into the car, I would just sit there for like ten seconds, chanting to myself, "Drive on the left side of the road." <laughs> drive on the left side of the road because I had to overwrite that muscle memory. And also, you know how even if your car is a backup camera, if you're backing up, you're probably going to take your right arm, swing it over the passenger uh-huh. seat and look over your shoulder. It took me so and long I, to break that habit. <laughs> I still do it, but I also did it when I was in New Zealand. When I'm, my, I'm on the right side of the car. And so I'd <laughs> swing my right arm and elbow the window I was like, oh, I need to swing my left arm over the passenger seat. This happened multiple times. Neither the window nor the elbow broke. <laughs> I had an Australian coworker who would tell me a few times he would go get, get gas and be on the wrong side of the car. And he would get in the wrong side of the car when he's getting back into the car. <laughs> yep. Or how many times I went to make a turn signal and instead turned on my wipers. <laughs> and then when I finally figured it out and then I got back home and did just the opposite. <laughs> Great. But... But for what it's worth, in neither in New Zealand nor when I got back to the United States, was, did I ever make the mistake of getting on the wrong side of the road? Good, good. I mean, the important stuff I got down. There were no fatalities, no honking. <laughs> yeah. at, least, at least that you're driving, or at least the backwards driving. But, right. Uh, I mean, maybe they honked backwards, but I didn't know how to interpret that. <laughs> um, did you have any feel- opinions on Luke, their man who helped them through their forgetting? Do you remember him at all? <laughs> Uh, have I forgotten him? No, I, I don't know. Like when he first said, oh, urban legend tells of this and that. And I was like, how can you have urban legend when you have no memory? And then he showed me the totem. I was like, oh, so this is kind of like Memento where they put tattoos on their body and totems around their house that they have written records of things that they don't remember and how he even like blotched out some of his memories. And uh, that part sort of reminded me of the movie. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind with Jim Carrey. I haven't seen it either. I haven't seen it either. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I know the concept where like gotcha. there there is like a relationship that you're no longer in. That's the concept for this particular movie. That the memory of it brings you only pain and you wish you'd never dated that person. So you choose to have that memory wiped from you. And this guy chose to not remember his kids. And actually it also reminded me of the TV show Heroes there was a character who was referred to simply as the Haitian and his mem- his power was to remove specific memories from people uh, often against their will. And at one point there was this character whose daughter had died years ago and the Haitian threatens him and says, what if I just removed your memory of your daughter? It'd be like she never existed. And the, the guy is terrified by this idea. He's like, don't you dare, don't you take her from me. But of course, and well, the Haitian doesn't, but if he had, the guy never would have remembered her and wouldn't be upset. He's like, oh, you made me forget my daughter. You're like, you can't say that because you forgot her. So this guy was like, yeah, I don't want to remember my son. But then once he remembers him, he's like, oh, I'm glad I remember my son. So it's sort of a, it's also like the TV show Severance. Have you seen that show? I've never, none of these shows I've seen. Severance I've not seen. It's on Apple TV+. Plus. It's these uh, employees at an office who are given an option where their work and personal memories are splintered. So when they leave the office, they don't remember anything that happened at the office. And when they go back into the office, they don't remember anything that happens outside the office. So it's almost like in their mind, 
there exists two of them, one that exists solely at work and one that exists solely at home. So it, it's almost like that, like this guy who forgot his son, there's almost two of them. There's the one who doesn't remember his son and doesn't want to. And then there's the one who does remember his son and doesn't want to forget. You know, and uh, you can transition from one to the other without regret almost. Anyway, <laughs> why did you bring him up? Did you uh, have some thoughts? Like, I, I thought I kind of liked him. He was very mid. He was just a little guy through the episode. Uh, and just looking through, just like thinking back to the episode, trying to find any highlights of it. Like, Luke was kind of all right. Uh, he seemed like a good guy. Like he was, but nothing really memorable here. Like this episode failed on me so many levels. And like talking to Shar about it, she's like, like because we are fans of Kirst- Kirsten Beyer who wrote this episode for her work on the Voyager relaunch, and she's done work on Discovery and here a bit. But like Shar's like her episodes are all kind of mediocre. And I was looking through the list. I don't have it in front of me now at the moment, but they are all kind of mediocre. Not just Strange New Worlds, but also Discovery? Uh-huh. Oh. That's a shame. Um, so, like, great showrunner has great uh, general ideas. But, um... Uh... But here... Eh. <laughs> like, okay, her episodes. Um, and she, she did Picard, too. Uh, she did uh, CV Packham Parabellum on Discovery, which was the one where the, uh, Saru... Michael and um, Butthole, I don't like, um, <laughs> are on this where Saru starts getting some feelings and anger. He's running through this planet. Uh, this is season one episode. Okay. Um, uh, just before they just had this idea to go take a bunch of pictures to, of a cloaked area f- to find a ship. Very mid episode. Um, Saints of Imperfection, season two, is where we get. Um, um, Professor or Doctor Culber back from the Mushroom Land. Okay, eh, where they where the discovery is halfway through. Yep, uh, that's okay. Episode Unification Part Three. In retrospect, it was where uh, we're in Navarre in season three. Yep, and um, it's an okay episode uh, where they have a little trial on the ship. Eh, nothing magical to me. Um, in short trucks. Children of Mars, where it was a prelude to Picard. Oh, yeah. Okay. The, uh-huh. No dialogue whatsoever in that episode. Yeah. And Remembrance on Picard. This is the very first episode. Is oh. it okay? Of Picard. Yeah. Uh, and then start a city rag where we rip out each eye. Ugh. Probably a little um, not uh, getting rid of a character <laughs> uh, played by an actor who is not a good person. Hmm. Manu. Um that was it okay that was an episode a lot of people hate because the Picard does the ridiculous French accent <laughs> yes I remember that yeah and then this episode like none of them really stand out to me as more than three out of five stars as opposed to the episodes that Jonathan Frakes directs which are almost always excellent <laughs> I mean yes. but he but he didn't write those though I mean, like this is no genius. no I oh, right 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 I I get that each that Kristen and Jonathan have very different contributions and roles to play uh-huh. but I'm just talking about consistency of track record you know like like when jonathan frake shows up in the opening credits i know it's going to be a good episode gotcha, gotcha, i don't gotcha, know gotcha. that when Kristen shows up right right and now would you, say that, like, oh, mid. <laughs> would you say that this was her first stinker uh no i think a uh, uh, stinker i guess yes yeah, stinker yes but yeah. like cb packham parabellum two saints three yeah. unification three like yeah all of them are three at best okay so on this episode You said the planet doesn't make sense. And I agree. Like this asteroid landed a thousand years ago and yet they still have the ability to maintain some sort of a government because the castle was built with parts of the asteroid or something. uh, I don't know. Something in the middle of the castle. But how is this a society? How is this planet a society? It's more than just these people here. Right. It makes no sense. Um, Like normally like that kind of level of deeper thing is not interesting to me. But... I couldn't not think of it here because right. everything outside this bubble of this castle area makes no sense at all. Yeah, and they also felt it was not a violation of the Prime Directive to remove the asteroid. I'm like, I feel like there's lots of precedents where they would have let it crash unless the planet was warp capable. I mean, until they, the uh, Prime Directive is very loosey goosey. Uh, <laughs> yes, as, as we, we talked did, about in episode two. <laughs> yeah, as we tra- determined on trial, it's you know at your whims. Uh, I was disappointed that Zach, who was a former Star Trek officer, just like 
became so practically evil. And it was what to eight a years to a degree, you can attribute that to the planet. But going back to your point about the lower decks episode that had the Enterpriseans, you know, uh, that, that... Prodigy. prodigy. Oh, oh, you're right. I'm sorry, Prodigy. I already misquoted you in earlier in this episode of the you podcast. did, but I was like, ah, it just happened. <laughs> no, no, it's important to get right. So thank you. So when Prodigy had this episode, that was also a TOS cast member who was stranded on that planet. And he didn't begrudge anybody. Like, he left audio recordings, and they weren't bitter. I mean, that's also a different planet, but that's also different people. People are different. And this is just a secretary, a yeoman, like... Yeah. Like, chapel. Which we don't have anymore. <laughs> no. Yeah. Man, I, just, <laughs> I always think of Pike's line, the original pilot, not being able to get used to women on the bridge. <laughs> like, yeah, when he said that in the cage, I was like, wow. And then there was this episode. Well, we'll talk about it in a minute. I'll hold on to that. One thing I did not like about this episode among the Lotus Eaters was at the end, Pike said that you're like, when you lack memories, you show who you really are or something. Uh And he was about to kill Zack and not out of self-defense. He was just like, enough. I'm tired of your blathering. He powers up the rifle and then his memory comes back and he says, I'm not going to kill you, Zack. I was like, really? So that's who Pike is? When he doesn't have his memory? I thought that too. This was the first time. Like, was this really your takeaway? But no, um, that's not what the show episode was trying to say. It was, I mean, it was trying to say that, but not how it, we took it away for the first viewing. My second viewing, like, okay, I see. Pike was still the Boy Scout. He was trying to do what was the right thing. And the killing was the, his last resort of this guy who was not. And, and uh, basically this guy was, Zach was killing Zach was his last resort but he didn't want to go that far pike did not want to do it but he saw it was the only solution and that was more aligned with like okay pike is still a good boy scout here but when all else fails uh, i still don't think that message came wrong through clearly i saw that they were trying to say in my second viewing but i still don't think that came through um as well as they intended yeah, Pike definitely came across to me like the antagonist in that scene. Like he was just oh. beating a man who was already down. Yeah, and I, th- I think they just put poorly got to that point, uh, uh, storytelling wise. Huh. Because, um, yeah, I, if, uh, I, I'm not going to ask anyone to ever watch that episode again, ever. But, but you, you did, are going to watch it with somebody again. I know. So I'm not going to ask anyone else to. I'm not going to subject <laughs> upon anybody else. And kind of go into understanding of, for, at that moment, it's Pike's last resort to try to fix the problem. Like his very last resort, huh. um, you can you can probably see the hint of what they're trying to go for and how they failed getting to that point <laughs> in storytelling. Exactly. Weird. I don't usually read reviews online of individual uh-huh. episodes. Do you know if other people hated this episode as much as you do? I was flabbergasted at the positive reaction of this episode. This is classic Trek. This is amazing. Uh, this is what it really was like the original series felt like. And I'm like, what? Do we watch the same thing? Look at the title of the thread. Yep. What? <laughs> wow. Uh, but even like one of my favorite review shows was so mid at best on this episode. Uh, that's Trek huh. Culture's Ups and Downs. Like, um, they didn't have very pop- many ups to go for this episode, which is uncommon for them. Huh. And to be clear, I'm not asking what other reviews said in order to like lend yours social capital. Uh-huh. I was just curious because, yeah. like, I th- as I said, I thought it was the weakest episode of the season to date. But I was surprised to hear how much you reviled it, and I was wondering what other diversity of opinion might be out there. And I'm surprised to hear that, even though like neither ne- you and I agree that it wasn't great, just we don't agree on the severity. And uh-huh. so, but I'm so. I, so I expected the reviews to similarly fall among that spectrum of how much they didn't like it and uh-huh. to what degree. And so for you to now tell me that people actually loved this episode, that surprises me. Not because it disagrees with you, but because it also disagrees with me. Like At least the Redditors. Oh, uh, Reddit. Char I felt very mid on this episode, too. Um, and we, we, I went down to LA and was hanging out with Char this last weekend. So we got to talk about it and watched it with their partner as well. And so, like, and he doesn't watch Trek, and he didn't have an opinion on it because he's just not a Trekkie. <laughs> but uh, it's just an episode of Star Trek to me, kind of thing. Um, but for, for me, it was so uh, like threshold 
is seen as one of the worst episodes of Star Trek. And I strongly disagree with that. I think that was a great episode until the last 10 minutes or so when they went to the lizard thing. That was a very good episode until the last 10 minutes. And that kind of ruins it. Never, it's all everyone remembers. Um, hmm. But like Voyager had a terrible episode season seven where it's all about um, seven um, trying to find a partner and has dates with holographic Chakotay. And it's a very disgusting episode. It's a terrible episode. It is not good. Similar to the heirloom candle in TNG. That's a terrible episode. But people don't remember. I mean, they remember the heirloom candle where she sleeps with a ghost. But but like these are some episodes that people, they are generally, genuinely very bad episodes of Star Trek. And I think this episode goes along with those. I think we need to do an episode of Transporter Lock where we cover our like bottom five Star Trek episodes of all time. Because it sounds like it would be like Sub Rosa, uh, Among the Lotus Eaters, Shades of Grey. Shades of Grey is terrible. Yeah. Uh, maybe the episode you just mentioned from Voyager Season 7. Yeah, I'm drawing a blank on the name right now, but I could find it momentarily. It just doesn't matter right now. Uh, wasn't there also an episode in Voyager Season 7 where like Seven accuses somebody of attacking her and nobody believes her and the person she accuses ends up killing himself? Uh, that was like season six, I think. But yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, there was one of those two. That was problematic. Uh huh. Which is one word for it. It's like uh, there but- are genuinely bad episodes, but people kind of remember the wrong ones as bad. Because I- go watch Threshold. You will probably enjoy it until the last 10 minutes or so before the lizard baby thing. There's one thing I don't like about Threshold on a technical level, and this is the same shortcoming that the latest Guardians of the Galaxy movie had. The idea that there is already a roadmap for evolution and we can accelerate Mm -hmm. it when evolution is actually adaptation to your environment. Yeah. So, for example, in Guardians of the Galaxy, they put an animal in a cylinder in a tube and they push a button and it evolves rapidly. And I was like, it should evolve to adapt to live in a tube (laughs) <laughs> like that doesn't mean it gets smarter it gets bigger it learns to talk it gets a bigger brain none of those things are needed to live in a tube you're just wow guardians of the galaxy 3 just did a mario brothers movie rewrite oh yes there you go i did yeah. not i never see, i have never bothered to see Galaxy guardians 3 all i could think of when you're telling me the scene was super mario brothers the movie from the 90s <laughs> i forgot about that yeah that too <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of the Guardians series, but I thought the third one was the best of the three. Yeah. However, it's a hard movie to watch if you love animals. That's what I hear. Isn't it? Now, it does say at the end of the film, no animals were harmed in the filming of this production. <laughs> no CGI was filmed. <laughs> the CGI, that's the animals that are hurt are all CGI. And I know that intellectually, but it's still pull, tugged on my heartstrings. Mm hmm. Even though I had that experience, I still think it's the best of the Guardians movies. And maybe that's a contributing factor to why it was the best is because a lot of these superhero Disney movies are just like action romp and stomps with no emotional oh. current. And mm-hmm. this one had that. When, you know, And it was hard to see. And that's not a bad thing. But yeah. Anyway. Uh, I don't know that I have much more to say about... I'm surprised we went this long with talking about Among the Lotus Eaters, but we didn't really talk about the episode. We're going to share of it. I'm so ready to forget this episode. We went on a lot of tangents. Like, okay. I talked about Severance and Guardians of the Galaxy, and we talked about <laughs> Threshold. Uh, Patel and Pike, you get back together. Cool. They make out. All right. Or at least yep. in the next 30 minutes, and we'll see how it goes. Yep, yep. Apparently it went well, I'm guessing. Okay. Uh, charades! <laughs> Charades. Yeah, I just watched this like two hours ago. Nice. Me too for my second time. I'll have to do it third time soon. Um, <laughs> I will break you. <laughs> yeah, uh, we finally see Kirk back. Sam Kirk, George Kirk, call him uh-huh. what you will. Uh-huh. But yeah, uh, I thought it was funny that in this episode, not only is Spock made human, but he's essentially made an adolescent human. Uh-huh. Um, so, did you well, did you like do you, do you watch teasers? Did you know what this episode was going to be about going in? I, I watched it, but it, see the only teaser. See it when when uh, at the end of Ready Room they'll give a little teaser of the episode, but it gives almost a non spoilery teasers. Like the only part that they like, I know like you are careful about spoilers, but like the teaser here was just um, Chapel and Spock on the shuttle skidding towards the time rift. 
and that's be- and then waking up, something's wrong, but we don't know what. Like, like there's not a spoiler there. Like, there's nothing. There's nothing given away about the episode at all. Um, huh. Obviously, not every teaser is like that, but like nothing hinted at what this episode was going to be about in the teaser. Huh. Um, Interesting. Uh, and so this, like, like so they do that a lot with the ones on the radio room. Like, like they'll show you a scene, but like you have no idea the context or how they get there. Like, and they didn't. But um, so I didn't know what this episode was going to be about. I had no idea Tapering was going to be here, um, or anything like that. So when Spock woke up in sick bay and everybody else around him was like, "Uh, yeah, something went wrong," and they sort of drew out the revelation. Uh-huh. Did you have any expectation of what it was oh. going to be? No, no, I was trying to figure out what it was. Like, the teaser did not reveal that. It cut away before. Yeah, but, so even though the teaser didn't tell you, when once yeah, you I had no the idea. Full episode. No idea what it was going to be. For some reason, I, mean, I I thought like I thought his body from the neck down was going to look or be different because they were obscuring that. I, was, oh. I thought like maybe he like he was a robot or something. Uh huh. Uh huh. Or he had like That's this. Kind of on those lines. Yeah, I was like, what weird thing has happened to him? Yeah. Not to be human, which is I guess weird, but. <laughs> yeah, and this is not without precedent in Star Trek. For example, the season six episode six of Voyager riddles when Tuvok loses his memory and his emotional inhibition and mm-hmm. he actually becomes a really good cook in the kitchen with yeah, yeah yeah so that was one episode where a vulcan became more human and then of course there have been lots of episodes where people especially kirk is split into two different halves uh-huh. and this was kind of like that tell. right <laughs> yeah. this was kind of like that except you only get the one half i got a kick out of the the, the instructions were mixed or like, or like there was mixed uh, what was the phrasing of yellow I forget, but yeah, the, the the remediation did not, directions were unclear or something. Had mixed instructions. Mixed a instructions. A way to say a half. I'm like, that was a clever. Yeah, I like that. Um, honestly, so like, Shar, knowing how much I hated the last episode, I was like, I was excited to tell her, I can't wait for you to watch this. I love this episode. And then she's like, she replies to me. She's like, kind of like that. What did you like about this? Like, like, um... And it's funny to me how much we can take out of an episode. I kind of, while I watched it and enjoyed the, wow, aren't Vulcans funny? Um, bit Yet again, we went to that well again for the second season in a row. I was more completely 100% locked in on the chapel, Spock, unrequited, will they, won't they angle for the entire episode where that was the A plot to me. And the Vulcan isn't Vulcan culture weird? Yeah. Um, was such a minor part. I didn't even notice that when I was telling Shar how much I love this episode because I love the Spock Chapel relationship so much. And it I won't go into it, but it had some like, very personal meaning to me too. Like I was bawling the first time I watched this as they are kissing at the end. <laughs> um, and that, that's why I love this episode so much. Like and her whole scene where she's in the AR room talking to blue and yellow. Um, uh, and and both Ortegas and Uhura are rolling their eyes at her not admitting that she has feelings for Spock. Like that's what the episode was for was was for me. And Spock and the ritual was all the B plot. Huh. Yeah. The revelation that Spock shifted the shields to her mm-hmm. was unexpected and subtle, but really important because it implies something else. There, I don't like. You don't know that he would do that for anybody else per se Mm -hmm. it also sort of explains like we don't know if that's why she was unharmed but we can assume it was Mm -hmm. uh i mean she doesn't we know it it's the implication that's what they're going for yeah like she doesn't have mixed instructions so it's possible that she could have been harmed and just completely healed or maybe she would have been made half vulcan Mm -hmm. who knows but yeah i when they finally get to the point where she has his vitamins And she knows that she's basically about to say goodbye to the Spock who is able to communicate his feelings to her. Her eyes. I I thought that was when they were going to kiss. Instead, she cuts it off before they can and injects him with the vitamins. I know it's not actually vitamins, but yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that was... And, you know, she kept talking to Ohora and Erica about... This is our one chance to save Spock. If we don't do it in the next 24 hours, we'll never save Spock. I was like, that's an interesting choice of words because you're not saving him. There's nothing wrong with being human. 
he's still himself. He's just a more fully a certain half of himself. Yeah, I don't so, think they're trying to say there's something wrong with him. It's just not him. Right. So it, I, I, I guess it kind of goes back to Tuvix. Like, this is a different Spock, and you're going to kill that Spock to bring back the Spock you know. Uh, they're not really killing him, though. I don't, I, I, I don't hold it that. I acknowledge that what I've proposed here is an extreme <laughs> interpretation. <laughs> but, you know, maybe given time, human Spock would not have wanted to go back to being half Vulcan. Maybe. We'll never know. Ever. Because we don't have any knowledge of future Spock. None. Whatsoever. <laughs> we have no idea what he's like after this episode. Okay. Like, I, I'm not to harp on the spoiler thing, but I thought there was an interesting thing here that made me... I know, like, uh, we've had talks before, lots of times here and offline about spoilers. Yep. And uh, I was thinking, like, this episode is a good example to... Uh, I think it might be a good example of, like, how I view spoilers... I know how the story ends, but getting there is the interesting part because we know Spock and Chapel are not together. We know Spock and T'Pring are not together. Um, and like, we know all the Spock's his, like, future. Um, it's so, like, this is basically, this episode shows me like it's more interesting getting to that point. And like, it's not necessarily, um, to say like you are right or wrong. I think this is an example for me of like how it's still interesting to me Mm. Of all the parts in between of getting to what we know. I can see how the feeling would be similar. The goal uh, for me, the difference is that a prequel doesn't make the original into a spoiler because this is how the storytellers wanted you to know the story. If a murder mystery book, the okay. first chapter starts with a character's death. And then the second chapter starts with one week earlier. Uh -huh. You know, I don't consider the first chapter a spoiler because I'm reading the book as it was intended and I'm watching Star Trek in the order it was intended. Uh, but still, you're right that in either way, whether or not the authors intend it that way, you know the end. And it can still be interesting to know how they get there. Yeah, that's how I view a lot of things. Like if something spoils in a movie for me, hmm. uh, to me, it's the journey. Uh, and so this just this is just an example of like it's, now you can kind of see my viewpoint. That is all. That was all. I didn't have anything really deeper to go. It's like this is how I approach that. So that was all. But we still don't know how it ends uh -huh. or why. Rather, we don't know why. And it makes me a little sad because I like them as a couple. Tragic. It's tragic. It's gonna break my heart. <laughs> it hasn't already. Yes, it has. Because we know, oh. and it's it's beautiful tragedy. I can't wait to see how it falls apart and ball over it. <laughs> well, what do you think about the fact that Spock is, even if he's taking time apart from his betrothed, doesn't change the fact that he is engaged. Uh -huh. Should he be engaging in antics with other people? That's not for me to determine. <laughs> I suppose not. I'm sure if T'Pring found out, though, she'd call off the engagement. Uh-huh. She already knows something's up. She was the way she was looking at them when she was when Tra Chapel came with the vitamins. She knows something's up. Um, but there were a lot of things up at that moment in the episode, like the fact that he was human. Yes, but you know, <laughs> she knows his she eyebrows knows were singed. That was great. Uh, um, it was just a beautiful moment when they finally got to kiss. But there's more to this episode, even though. <laughs> I mean, like, like now we know this gives context to why T'Pring is so terrible in the original series episode during um, uh, the breakup or the end of the marriage. Like the character, like they didn't have any history like this find out, but she was kind of a terrible character in that. Like, she was cruel and mean hmm. in that episode. But now we have context to how we get there. That just what didn't exist before. Yeah. Um, and we have Chapel longed for Spike, Spock, Spike. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Spock in original series and now we have context for that I think it's just so beautiful and uh, it's going to break my heart the journey to get to where we know they go to oh. and we know that Chapel gets married to um, Corby I didn't she know she gets that. married between now and original series wait on TOS she's married uh, she was married at least at some point uh -huh. because even on TOS she's flirting with Spock yeah 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 I think I think the marriage is over too because um there was an episode where Dr. Corby, Richard Cor Corby, is an android, but he was reconstructed. We find out Chapel was married to him at some, the actual guy at some point, which oh. is also referenced in this episode. Um, 
this episode? Which I didn't catch yet. Uh, when uh, the episode, her the shipmates are all grilling her on three rules of so and so, whatever. It's Corby, and uh, the guy who she eventually marries. Um, for a short time before original series, she is ma- basically sometime between now and original series. She is married and no longer married to this person. He was in this episode. No, but he, his name was mentioned. Oh, okay. Huh. Um. Yeah. Um. I didn't catch it. Uh, until afterwards and seeing people talk about it. Interesting. Um, huh. Yeah. Uh, aren't Vulcans funny? <laughs> we went to that well again. It kind of feels like Vulcans are to Strange New Worlds as Ferengi are to Deep Space Nine. Oh my god. At least, at least in, the, in these two episodes. The other one being when they mind swapped last yeah. season. Yeah. yeah. When they did the Freaky Friday thing. Um, uh... Poor, to bring his poor father, his whipped. I like him so much. He's, I love him too. He's like so excited about everything. His wife is like, no, you aren't. <laughs> yeah. And, but then at the very end, he's like, well, now that we're done, do you have any more of those crepes? <laughs> Finger guns. Yes, I yes. do. <laughs> I like Pike. He tries so hard. I'm like, oh, I use salt because it's a different cooking environment and a clever adaptation. No, it's not. No, it's not. You're right. You no, it's more, not. You just need more practice. <laughs> Um, uh, I did enjoy that little bit there, but still, like, it was just the love triangle thing was the more exciting yeah. episode, part of the episode. Um, um, like, like it was beautiful seeing, um, uh, why am I drawing a blank on her, his box mom's name? Why am I drawing a blank? Help me out. Lady Amanda. Yeah, Amanda. Um, the very uncommon name. Uh, that's why I forgot it. Um, uh, it was beautiful seeing her be a mother. Like she knew something was wrong with Spock was coming out the transporter pad. Um, that scene also had a hilarious moment where it's, it's in the background. And you, um, so if you don't see it, you don't see it. But Captain Pike, sensing how uncomfortable and awkward this scene was as it was going on and on as Spock is trying to hide his ears and Amanda figuring him out, he tries to skirt and leave oh. in the background. And the transporter door shuts on him. He's like <laughs> trying to get out. I didn't see that. It won't open <laughs> until the scene resolves. And then the automatic door sensing of the moment opens and let it, lets him out. <laughs> How did I miss that? It's in the background subtle. You're not, it's, if you're not paying attention to it, if you're paying attention to the conversation, you're not going to catch it. But, you know, the real goal of that scene was for Paramount to add hats to their merch store. Uh, right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, hide your human ears. The new Spock beanie. <laughs> I liked that at the end of this episode, the same racist insult was levied against Spock as was levied against him when he applied to the Science Academy in the 2009 movie. Yes, and those, they had the same outfits, or at least staying close, which is neat too. But your human failings. Yeah, your handicap, the fact that you're half human. And this time they're saying it right in front of his mother. And yeah. neither time did Spock allow this to pass. Neither time did he acknowledge or accept that he was handicapped by being half human. Yeah. And I really like that he stood up for his mother, for his mother's honor, for his family. Uh, I think Amanda in any incarnation is just a great character. And uh, I really liked her here. I thought she did a great job coaching her son and being in his corner. It was so sweet. Like, very, we're going to see a very motherly thing. Uh, I thought it was enjoyable. Uh, just seeing, um, you know, just watching that unfold. Uh, we got to see them just be a thing. And they do not, never mentioned Michael ever. It's like they're not never supposed to. Nope. Nope. We don't talk about her. We don't um, talk about Bruno. We don't talk about Michael. <laughs> Like, I know like, we're kind of just glazing over it, but I thought it was just really beautiful. Uh, yeah. The mother-son moments they had there. And they kind of touch on that. Like, they have really, ever since the 2009 movie, they have made attempts to show Amanda and Spock as um, their relationship together um, in the Discovery and um, here and even then. And I think it's kind of beautiful because uh, we never really got that. We didn't get that very deep in original series and TNG. Yeah. And I just dig it. I just dig it. Um, because, because who better to show Xbox human side than having 
the character of Amanda help guide him. Yeah. No, I get it. Um, you know, and speaking of the 2009 movie, when Spock first woke up in sick bay and they said that, you know, they told him you're human now. And he sat up in bed and said, what the f... And then they cut away. <laughs> that felt like a very Zachary Quinto thing to do. I, I, I could totally see that now. You mentioned that. Yeah, like as soon as they cut away to the commercial, I was like, that was Zachary Quinto. You know? <laughs> and I don't think it was intentional on their part. I mean, I think uh, this actor is great at bringing his own interpretation. But clearly, every actor who is doing Spock even if they have their own interpretation, it's still the same character. Mm-hmm. And I felt like he momentarily tapped into somebody else's Spock for a second there, or at least a different actor, because Zachary Quinto, like, you, you ever see that car commercial he did with yep. Leonard Nimoy? Yep, yep, yep. Yep, and then, of course, he was on Heroes, and he's just a, he's a great guy. I like him as a person. And this, uh, he has a, a way of delivering lines that you don't get to do when you're Spock, necessarily. Mm-hmm. But, I, you know, going back to him defending his human honor when he said to the Starfleet Academy or not Starfleet Academy, the Vulcan Science Council, live long and prosper. You know, the way he said it, he was actually saying, F you. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, and the way that only Zachary Quinto could turn those words into that meaning. And I felt like we saw that this week just a little bit. Um, I, I thought when I mentioned this a moment ago, I thought that was you were referencing a different scene when I first started saying it, but um, the Vulcan Science Academy. Yes. These are the same outfits are similar to the ones from the 2009 movie, which I thought was a nice callback. Mm. And then when I um, suggested going back to watch Q&A, the short track, yep. uh, when they were first leaving off in the turbo lift, there was a massive callback to the 2009 soundtrack. Like, it's weird to have the cross. They rarely cross the streams when it comes to the movies and new yeah. track. They've only done it once in Discovery. But there was a music part where the horns are going. And dun, 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 dun. I'm like, holy crap. They just, it was a total beautiful little nod. And I like that they, tiny little connections to it, even though they're supposed to be completely separate. Um, I think it's a little fun that way. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the reasons that there has been so little crossover between the movies and the TV shows is because at the time that those movies were made, CBS and Paramount were somewhat yeah. separate. One yeah. owned the movies, the other owned the TV shows. Exactly. And now that we can do that, they have made their little nods and even had one character from Dis- in Discovery um, absolutely reference the the mining ship yep. universe, um, yep. which I think it was just a fun, fun little thing. But I'm glad. So I just like hero seeing the Vulcan sides. I thought it was neat. That's all. I really didn't have anything deeper to say than that, but... I- kept going on on anyway <laughs> well you know so many franchises are doing the multiverse nowadays like dc uh with the Ugh. flash movie marvel with dr strange um uh, spider-man into the spider-verse even on the even flash D&D is doing it <laughs> really uh-huh i have a monsters of the multiverse book i'm back here because in D all the settings oh, most right. of the settings are Different in the general planes. universe but um uh but, but they all touch on variations on the elves or variations on this like, like yeah like i always loved the multiverse growing up and now that i'm living in a universe that adores it as well i'm like okay i'm done with it <laughs> uh, you're such a hipster I you liked am. it before it was cool uh-huh but even the flash tv show which right used to be good uh they did a crisis on infinite earths thing uh-huh. and they brought in the christopher reeve superman they brought in the michael keen batman uh, they brought in Smallville, the TV show. But what I, I mean, those were meaningful to me, having grown fun. up with that stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah. But the the one crossover I did not expect was with the Justice League movie. And they had Ezra Miller show up as The Flash on the TV show, The Flash, oh, really? yeah. with Grant Gustin. And they actually had a scene where they were talking to each other. And like Ezra Miller, uh, no, Grant Gustin says to Ezra Miller, your outfit looks so cool. And, Grant, and uh, Ezra Miller says, yours looks so comfortable. <laughs> you know, it, was a very, it was less than a minute long and uh-huh. there was no action. It was just dialogue. But it was a TV show movie crossover. Just like how some people think that Grant Gustin should have gotten the chance to play The Flash in the movie because he does such a good job on the TV show. 
but that's neither here nor there. This is if a anything about the multiverse, though, plot lines, maybe it will get people to shut up about, well, come this doesn't do that. How come here? Because we get people to accept that there are different actors playing these same characters and we don't have to, you know, like, we don't have to judge them on things that don't matter. Like, why is their costume different? Why did this person do that? Like, like just let them be their own universes. Acknowledge that we know that they are a different version of the character. Right. Um, uh, I hope maybe that will help. Maybe the multiverse love that's happening right now will help people get over that. Well, the Spider-Man, they kind of went into that in the Spider-Man movie that you and I saw in theaters, uh-huh. where two of the Spider-Men, I think, had mechanical web slingers and one was organic. Uh-huh. And the other two were like, where does it come from? Does it come out of <laughs> other parts of you? What is going on here? Whereas like the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man was a sign of his times. You know, like a, a nuclear radioactive Spider-Man when Spider-Man was first created back in the 60s or so. Yeah, like during the Cold War, that made perfect sense. But now we're in an age of genetic engineering. And to get bit by a genetically engineered spider makes a lot more sense nowadays. Yeah. You know, whereas I think I've told you before about my hairstylist, great guy, love him so much. We talk about superhero movies all the time. For some reason, he wants everything to be exactly the way it was in the comic book. He wants every movie to just be a straight one-to-one adaptation. (laughs) He hates when they reinvent things. And I was like, well, did you know that the original Spider-Man wasn't bitten by genetically engineered spider? It was radioactive. He's like, really? I was like, yeah, Spider-Man isn't supposed to have organic web sling. He's supposed to have mechanical ones. He's like, oh, well, I hate that now. <laughs> <laughs> like, he liked Tobey Maguire fine until I told him. Wow. You know, I always thought that was just, everyone knew that. I guess, wow. Yeah. Huh. Or like I said, I told him, if you want every superhero movie to be just like the original comic book, then Superman can't fly. He can only leap tall buildings. Mm-hmm. You know, that something, that's something that they changed in the comic book. So which Superman is the canonical one for you? Because even in the comic books, it's never the same. Uh-huh. Watch out for yeah. that. <laughs> oh, never mind. I won't go into that. <laughs> okay. No, no. I was just going to go off on a tangent. We're talking about Star Trek, not the Superman. Um, we finally got to see the new bar set. Can I get that to go? <laughs> the burgers look great. No. Um, I knew this bar set was coming because I saw them talking about it in the previews like uh spring and we hadn't got to see it yet really uh looks, and so looks a little bit like it. discovery's bar uh no this is a brand new set built for this okay uh discovery has one too yeah they had the fireside fire but no, no, uh, they built a brand new one for episode or season two for enterprise or strange new world excuse me oh, fun for the enterprise and i love the whole like 60s callback the flashback like totally cementing that like by the time kirk comes in this era like there's just a 1960s revitalization, <laughs> which is fun. Which aspect of the 60s is being revitalized? Oh, the architecture of the bar was total. Like it looked like the 60s, which not a TOS oh. being made oh, in the I, 60s. I miss that. Uh, yeah, you just gotta look back at it. Like, yes, this is a 60s bar. <laughs> yeah, a futuristic 60s bar. Huh. Yeah, it's not um, often we get new sets. We've talked before about how things like the Battle Bridge are always just redressed for other things, and uh-huh. so to actually have a nice new set, that's rare and pretty cool yeah uh i i would have to try to dig the fine what the video is it, there was no spoilers other than that the set existed oh yeah. like like they were just like they would refuse to talk about season two um beyond that um but they were just very excited about this it's a beautiful set um so so i was watching a youtube video recently it was a super cut of various scenes from tng focusing on commander Riker, because in the very first season he says Humanity no longer enslaves animals for food purposes. Mm -hmm. And then the supercut is all the scenes in the next six seasons of Riker eating animals. I think it was all replicator. Yeah, but like like at one point he says, oh, I got these eggs fresh just this morning. You know, he's Mm -hmm. cooking omelets or he'll go on a Klingon ship and eat gawk. I was like, well, that's not Starfleet. I can cut him some some slack for that. But. Then in this episode, Pike is talking about always use fresh herbs, not replicated. You can tell the difference. And then we see Spock eating bacon. And I have to wonder a couple of things. One, is this real bacon or replicated? Because Pike can probably tell the difference. And second, whether or not Starfleet is vegetarian, I'm pretty sure Vulcans are. And so Spock eating bacon, even if he is now human, seems like a violation. So I hope it was fake bacon. 
Uh, it might have been. I guess this is uh, human experiencing new things. Um, forgetting himself, like he was in teenager mode. Sure. I mean, there was no. an awkward scene with him uh, checking out Laon, and then both of them are kind of silently acknowledging this. And Laon's like, "Nope." Spock's like, "Correct." <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad they didn't make some th- remark about how Spock couldn't stand up out of his chair at that moment because it'd be embarrassing. <laughs> we didn't need that. But yeah, I mean, as a vegetarian myself, I you can't see yourself, and most people would hold that back. I can yeah. totally see that they wouldn't give in to that. Yeah, yeah, just because you're not Vulcan anymore, it's kind of like I don't know if this is the same thing. It's all I can think of. Like when you're a kid and you go over to your friend's house, you still have to follow your parents' rules, even though you're under somebody else's mm-hmm. house. Like if your parents say you can't ever have soda ever, and you go to your friend's house and they say, "Do you want a soda?" You're like. Oh, sure, because that's fine here. Like, no, you can't do that. You can't uh-huh. have soda. Oh, I would still you know. do it. <laughs> well, there was a Baron St. Bear's book all about this. That's how I learned. Gotcha, gotcha. You, you follow right. your parents' rules even when you're with somebody else's parents. Um, We can't be held too closely to Star Trek's past and what things they've said, though, because they don't follow it. And, like, we've established that uh, T'Pol established that Vulcans are vegetarian. But I, maybe if I remember that, it's awkward as Spock is. I don't know if we've ever established Spock is vegetarian. Maybe we have. I just don't remember and I don't care, to be honest. <laughs> uh, to me, that doesn't make the character. Unless, I mean, it's just not interesting to me. So in, I just did a quick Google search. Apparently in the TOS episode, all our yesterdays, huh? Spock was revealed as being vegetarian. Interesting. But that's, be, that's after this. Yes, it is possible that he became vegetarian after Strange New Worlds. Yeah, like, man, this bacon, he, like, he doesn't want to not eat it anymore. Like, it was such, he got so sick off of it uh, that he never wants to eat again. Uh, like, I make it for lost time. Why do I feel nauseated? <laughs> um, uh, I really don't have much more to say other than I love this episode a lot, mostly for the love triangle part of it. Which is usually a thing I hate, but they're doing it so well. But um, there was a fun nod to Enterprise here. Oh. Um, that because uh, back then, T'Pol would comment about how much humans smell. I yes, I picked it. up on that. Uh-huh. And because it's the first time I think we've really had a nod back to that that smelliness to Vulcans. Yeah, when Spock said that, I was like, oh, just like T'Pol, because mm-hmm. uh, for some reason, sometime in the last five years, I rewatched that scene, like. Archer and Trip were really racist at the beginning of Enterprise. Oh yeah, they're awful. Yeah, like, I was talking because I was talking to Shire about this this morning and about that scene of Spock and like, oh no, now I'm having flashbacks to Reed in Shuttlebot Pod One having a little daydream of calling to Paul Stinky. <laughs> I and, remember that um, episode. I don't remember that daydream. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's imagine we're calling her Stinky and getting her to laugh about it. But I'm like. I told Shar, like, God, Enterprise would have done so much better if they had at least one woman behind the camera anywhere. <laughs> oh, they didn't? I'm sure they had at least. But it was it was run by Brandon Braga and Rick Berman, two mm. terrible people. Uh, or like one of them is terrible. He's the one who was dating seven or um, Jerry Ryan at the time and and uh there was some not good things going on there. Um yeah. but like there was no women there were no women writers for that show on this maybe a one off here and there. Until mm. the very fourth season, like yeah, those two should have given up on Enterprise and let other people make it because it could have been so much. I don't. Enterprise is one of my favorites, and there were some awful things when you go back just twenty years. Mm. <laughs> and sorry, I went on a rant there. <laughs> no, that's fine, and it's nice to see how far we've come. And not speaking, I can't say per se about behind the camera, but in this episode, we see Spock trying to enjoy a ladies' night out. Uh huh. You know, he's hanging oh my out. God, with these... They're so fun. Well, I mean, he was hanging out with four women because that's mostly who the officers are on this uh-huh. ship. And I felt like he was the odd person out, not because he was Vulcan, but because he was a dude. Uh-huh. They were also really fun in taking care of him, too. Like, they talk flatter. <laughs> Just really how I sound? And all four of them, yes. <laughs> and Lana's like, definitely. Yeah, like, definitely. move your eyebrow and no other facial muscles. <laughs> It was kind of like that TNG episode where there's a little boy who wants to grow up to be Data. Mm-hmm. You know, and he, as they're getting haircuts, he keeps moving his head very jerkily. And Data's like, do I do that? 
I had no idea it was so annoying. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's how you are, Data. Yeah. Even the computer game sentience for a little bit in, in like season one of uh, TNG and got mad at Data once. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, he kept querying. And at one point, the computer even got annoyed at him. <laughs> what, how so? What is that? I don't remember the episode. He just kept asking question after question after question. And basically, the computer's like, N-, and basically, I don't remember her wording. It was like, knock it off or <laughs> stop it. Huh. I'll have to go look that up. I don't remember the exact moment, but it's, yeah. So I know that the romance was the key plot in this episode mm-hmm. for you. To me, anyway. Uh, but I, I do want to point out what my favorite line of the episode mm-hmm. was. It's not, I will break you. <laughs> That's close. That's like a close second. Uh, and also because I felt very seen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favorite line was when Spock said, sometimes I don't cry in the shower. Oh, that was hilarious. <laughs> because I thought he was serious. I didn't know he was joking. And I was like, oh my God, you poor man. And you're joking about this. You are, well, you really maybe, are human now. <laughs> maybe when he turned human, though, he was crying a bit more. Because <laughs> he's going through it. But yeah. um, maybe it was self-depreciation. Yeah, I mean, we maybe, won't know. And I think it's fun. <laughs> yeah, like maybe he was serious. Then he realized like, oh, that went dark. So he's like, oh, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah. uh, funny. but also this is all supposed to have happened within the 24 hours of his accident so how many showers do you take in 24 hours <laughs> i don't know sometimes maybe it's like wow i can have all this weird feeling <laughs> okay. i didn't mean it in any dirtier way than that Just, yeah I'm sure you didn't okay um oh vulcans not examining a moon in their own system and they've been space flying in space for hundreds of years the kirkovians what oh this oh, is in the vulcan system that. Yeah, it was the Vulcan system. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, but that was—I mean, that was a little weird. But the Kirkovians were in the whole very um, tech center type calling tree to get help. <laughs> it was amusing. <laughs> yeah, they're like, no further communication is needed, and nobody thought to ask. Then why did you leave your calling card? Mm-hmm. It's just because you wanted credit for the work. Uh, well, this is to make your one-time complaint. Um, uh, if you or comment on your, this is this is where you put your five-star review. Uh, <laughs> but they didn't even say what the response period was. They didn't. You would just know because you're Kirkovian. Every time I heard that name, though, I thought, Captain Kirk? Like, oh, yeah. Like, Enterpriseians worship uh-huh. Enterprise. Kirkovians <laughs> worship Kirk. Like, should we have, like, Pycovians? <laughs> um, Jess Bush was the one I interviewed on Ready Room this week, and she was talking about how the AR wall, that whole scene in there was so, they had to be in there like six to eight hours, something like that, and they got, it was so hard for them because of all this stuff going around. And when the camera moves, it's not them, their movements. It's the camera moves makes the sh- the the ship the the room the effects in the walls move. So they would kind of get a little sick from there. You couldn't see your points on the ground where you had to stand your markers wow. uh, very well, or they kept rubbing off. And like having to be in a room of those floating spheres for that long. <laughs> what a, she was like, about how what a difficult day that was. I would Just love to see what that room looks like pre-production. I'll get some pictures for you. Uh, they even showed some in the, in the shots in their episode, but uh, it's really neat. Um, man, I com- talked about this on Twitter yesterday a bit. The AR room, when they use that, it's when they don't use it well, it stands out so well, hard to me and takes me out of the episode for a minute before I jump back in. Like here in this room, um, it stood out immediately. And, the sh- and uh, when it's um, last week when they were on the... The Forgetting Planet, uh, Rachel Seven, it stood out so hard. Um, but when they're in engineering, I know it, but it fits. They used it in the background for the courtroom set. Um, it fits there. They use it in the background of a lot of things. But when when they don't use it well, it stands out so hard and takes me out for a second of any episode mm. I'm watching. Because it's not seamless. Right. Uh, I could just see the floor versus that. Um, Interesting. And uh, sometimes they do it very well. Sometimes they do not. Um, and and uh, here it stood out to me again. They're on the shiny. They're on the on uh, they're on the set of the engineering room where the floor is super shiny, and then they have all these effects going off. Okay, <laughs> I can just tell. Well, I'm glad you're calling it an AR room because historically you've called it a holodeck, which yeah, I found confusing. Yeah, yeah the holodeck because uh, because I call it that because in one of the discovery. Behind the scenes, they had a sign calling it the holodeck. Which makes sense, but in the context of talking about uh, Star Trek, like which holodeck are you talking about? <laughs> kind of like, is I mean, it like, the cage lowercase or the cage capital? 
Oh, for me, I figured I'd just assume because there's no holodecks in this era that we see. Uh, Enterprise found oh, a way. They had, they had a holodeck hard. episode. Oh, yes, but, but we're not talking about Enterprise, usually on this show. Right, but Enterprise uh, was... What, what, what I'm saying is Enterprise was like 100 years earlier. Uh-huh. So just because they don't have holodecks yet doesn't mean that they couldn't. You just have a different it takes you out of the the it takes you out of my sentence for a second before you realize what i'm talking about just like i'm making a complaint it takes me when i realize it takes me out of the episode for a minute <laughs> <laughs> well we don't have our universal translators turned on what do you say um right all right yeah. we're talking about an hour we're going over an hour now yep and uh we talked way longer about <laughs> among the lotus eaters than i thought we would or around it <laughs> don't you just wish we could forget that happened the what right Cool. Well, we're halfway through the second season. Already, we still have the lower decks episode coming up. I don't know when. Nope. I mean, it's on the. I haven't looked uh, at that. Well, I know the name of the episode. Yeah. What is it? Do you want me to tell you? Go for it. Uh, Those old scientists. Oh yeah, you did tell me this. You did tell me this. I can't wait. So that must be the lower decks episode. I forget which one it is. I promise you, it's one of the next five. (laughs) Perfect. Yeah. But yeah, I like where season two is going. I'm having fun watching it, and mm-hmm. I don't want it to end because this is probably the most fun trek there is. Yes, Strange New World is so much fun. I adore it, and I still listen to that theme song every time. And Oh, I'm glad you do. So do I. And we don't know what trek is going to air after this one, do we? Um, I think Lower Decks is up on the block next, but um, when that is, maybe Discovery. I don't know. I don't know when. Um, we know Discovery is done filming and did all their reef shooting when they were canceled um, already a long time ago. I just haven't looked at what's next. Yeah. And supposedly there's another Star Trek movie coming out. Oh, that, yeah, that hasn't even started writing yet. <laughs> yeah, a while back they gave a release date and then they pushed it to December of this year. And it still can't be happening in December if they. I, don't I haven't even heard that they're shooting it yet. They haven't have a script yet, they haven't signed anybody yet. That's how. Yeah. That is in development hell as they are trying to decide if they even want to bring them back because because Paramount wants a huge mega billion dollar franchise, not forget not realizing that the last three movies that they tried to do that with aren't hitting it. Just go to your core fans. Don't expect the mega billions that that uh, MCU movies do. Just make a movie for the fans. Well, the 2009 Trek movie broke all kinds of box office records for the Star Trek franchise. I don't remember. But maybe for the Star Trek franchise, but it's not making the MCU level. Oh. That's what they're going for. It's basically, if it doesn't make six quadrillion, it doesn't make you all the dollars, it's a failure in their mind. And you're not going to get that with Star Trek ever. Ever. And they need to stop trying to do that. So just for what it's worth, I just pulled up on IM. No, this isn't IMDb. Oh, it's Box Office Mojo by IMDb. Okay. So it's a list of all 15, 15 Star Trek movies listed by uh, Lifetime Gross. So the f- top three movies are the three most recent ones in the Kelvin universe. Yeah. The 2009 one made $257 million. Uh, the fourth film, which is the only one not of the Kelvin universe, is Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. It made 109000 mm-hmm. And then Nemesis, okay. which was the most recent one before the 2009 film, made $43 million. Uh-huh. So the opening weekend for the 2009 film was $75 million. And... The neck, the biggest opening weekend for a Star Trek movie not in the Kelvin universe was First Contact at thirty million, so less than half of that. And so all, all studios can see is how much did Guardians of the Galaxy make? How much did um, Avengers make? We need to do that with Star Trek. I'm like, they're just looking at it wrong. Let me do a. Wow. Okay, I just did a quick Google search: Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three Global Box Office. 805 million. Yeah. So that's three times what the 2009 Star Trek film made. Made in its lifetime. Like, yeah. You're never going to get that with Star Trek. That's what they want. And so until they get over themselves at that, we're never going to get a new Star Trek movie. 
And yet, are, they're still talking about making a new Tron movie, aren't they? I haven't kept up with that. I thought Jared Leto was still attached to that. Ugh. Yeah. I know. Anyway. Uh, 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 I was by the way, close one, this up. Yeah. Well, well, one quick thing. I know you're trying to close up, but I went to the Chicago Game Space, which is like a video game museum in Chicago. Huh? It's really just like two rooms, but they had one room that was dedicated to the 40th anniversary of Tron, which was last year. Oh, fun. Uh-huh. I went there the day before the 41st anniversary of Tron. And I think maybe for the first time in my life, I got to play the full enclosure version of Discs of Tron. I don't think I've ever played that one. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about, though? Yeah, I don't think I've ever played that one. Yeah, these machines are very rare. You have to step into it. It's a it's a stand-up. It's an upright. But you're fully encased in it so that the speakers are around you. I remember hearing a story about one of these that was found in a warehouse and a guy in New Jersey had it shipped to him. And as they were taking it off the moving truck in New Jersey, they dropped it and it shattered. Oh, yeah. Dang. So I was very fortunate to be able to play one of these. I think I may have seen one when I went to Disney world back in 1985, Uh a year after Tron or two years after Tron came out, but so no, three years after Tron came out. But yeah, it was a very small space that I went to, the Chicago game space, but totally worth the trip. I had time to do either that or there's a catcade in Chicago <laughs> where you play arcade games while cats wander around. Really wanted to do both. Had to choose one. Went with the game space. No regrets. <laughs> so, anyway, that wasn't Star Trek. I just wanted to say, uh, you know, speaking of films that came out in the 1980s, like Voyage Home, so was Tron. I love Tron. Go check out the Chicago game space. Link in the show notes. Yes. Cool. Well, set me up so I can see the line. Well, Sabriel, it's been great chatting with you about the first half of Strange New World Season 2. I'm looking forward to another two to three episodes of this podcast with you as we continue mm. to enjoy the voyages of the USS Enterprise. Until then, it lives. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on iTunes and keep your hailing frequencies open by following us on Twitter at TransporterLock or subscribing to our podcast and email newsletter at TransporterLock.com.